Cosmic here and welcome back to another Legends of Runeterra video. Today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We're about a week into this new meta. A lot of people are figuring out, trying to figure out the new cards, at least from the official launch. And Bilgewater added a ton of cards all at once. And honestly, it can be overwhelming for the new player. So if you're either joining the game for the first time or maybe you've played a little bit in the open beta and then are now coming back to it because new set and hey, it's very exciting... You might not know where to start, so this video is really to talk about what new cards were added, which ones are good, which ones are, you know, at least some archetype builds possible, and then kind of what to avoid, right? If you're on a full free-to-play path, which Runeterra is very friendly for, you want to make sure you're not wasting anything, especially with those champion wild cards can be uh, some hot commodities that once they're used up, you feel really bad about, especially if you picked wrong. So Let's talk about the champions and we're going to get into the different cards in terms of what are the early picks and archetypes and kind of how they're performing. So really quick, just kind of stacking them all up, uh, talking about from the best to worst, right? So at least from a meta perspective and kind of what was seeing the most uh, play from the highest win rate, we have Misfortune. I would maybe argue from a personal standpoint, I would rate Twisted Fate higher if only because it goes into more decks. So again, this isn't going to be necessarily which of these are the best, period. Uh, you got to take into consideration how many decks do they go into, how good are those decks that it appears in, and then if it only appears in one type of list, like Nautilus, well, how good is that to the rest of the meta, right? You have to kind of weigh these a little bit differently. So Misfortune, I think, still gets the overall best pick because of how the meta has been shaping up this first week. And it's just a general good aggro card. And because the entire theme plays around the plunder mechanic, which wants you to deal the Nexus, uh, your enemy's Nexus damage, she does that, right? So this is kind of like the all-around best fit for uh, what the region wants to be doing. As I mentioned beyond that, I think Twisted Fate really is a very, very close second just because of the utility that this card has. Again, keeping in mind that from an archetype standpoint, meaning you, you have a build around Twisted Fate deck, they're pretty much non-existent. However, when you have Bilgewater with another region, you don't have a strong second champion pick, pretty much everyone's picking Twisted Fate right now. It's just a general good card, right? You have access to spider counters in red card. The blue card is just great for drawing a card, which is always nice. That replaces itself and give you a spell mana back. And then in some turns, if they're all in on, let's say, a Nautilus that needs to attack, they play their big Nautilus, you play Twisted Fate, you get to get the gold stun card, and you can prevent them from attacking. So really just from an all-around standpoint, it's a good utility card. So I expect this to be a very safe craft for set two, uh, again, now until we, whenever we get set three. Nautilus kind of falls here right in the middle, right? So the Deep Dex, which is the name of the archetype that it consists of, um, they've gotten several people to Masters now. The downside here is that it only goes in that list. So if you think about the versatility of some of the ones that these other offer, you know, you might want to build Nautilus because maybe it's your favorite champion or something, but you have to then commit to only playing one type of archetype. And for some people, right, if this is the first wild cards you're spending or you're relatively new, that's not necessarily a safe pick for being able to play a variety of decks. Now, again, if you like the deep archetype and you want a deck that does win and is performing well, then Nautilus is a fine pick. So this is really kind of square in the middle. It, it fills only one role or one type of deck, but it's doing fairly well. So that I would say, do your research, find out if you like that type of deck and how it plays out and the types of thing that you're doing. Personally, I love it. I think it's an amazing card. Uh, but, you know, your mileage may vary at the end of the day. And, of course, going back to the purpose of the video, it's supposed to help guide potentially new players or returning players what you might want to craft. So, Gangplank, another step down. This is an interesting one. This is certainly more versatile than, say, Nautilus, but it's not seeing a lot of play. And especially from a meta report standpoint, in terms of the snapshot that we did on Team Leviathan Gaming or that Swim has put out or some other teams, right? Or maybe based on your own personal ladder experience, you would probably also say that Gangplank has been pretty much missing. Uh, it, it's popped up in a couple decks, right? To be fair, it's popped up in the Shadow Isles and Bilgewater list, um, usually paired with Swain. But even then, that deck kind of fell off. It has some interesting matchups. It does have a, you know, a solid mm, tier two-ish spot, but it's a very difficult deck to pilot, and it's certainly doing worse than uh, Sea Monsters or the Deep Archetype, so that's why I'm ranking it one below that. And then Fizz, uh, it was really cute day one. 
Uh, but if you're like me and crafted a day one because you want to try out all the champions and have a review go out eventually, um, it's instant regret. I think that this might find a spot later on, maybe down the road once the meta defines a little bit more, once more people find the different types of combo decks that you can build with this, but it doesn't feel good. And I apologize if anyone else is out there like me and built it. Um, you probably didn't have a good time with it. And yes, there is like the really cute all-in standalone decks you can build. And um, there's some weird uh, tempo decks, right? Very low spell burst um, cost, so you can always protect them. There's some stuff that can get there. And obviously, Rally is still very strong with Fizz. But other than that, it's it's really been unper uh, underperforming and uh, lackluster, to say the least. So I like to think that there's room for Fizz to kind of go up in this list. But overall, um, with the exception of Twisted Fate and Misfortune... I honestly think this is where they're going to sit in terms of playability in the meta and how much of them that we're seeing. I think Twisted Fate and Misfortune are a solid, you know, number one spot. Nautilus is in a very comfortable number two spot. Gangplank is in third then, and Fizz is just bottom of the barrel. Uh, maybe maybe we'll see one deck. I, I'm not sure. And honestly, again, do not craft it right now. Definitely wait for someone else to have a more refined list, or at least someone gets to Masters with it, right? That's usually a good indication um, of someone who spent the time, they re refined the list, and they obviously had a positive win rate. So um, the champions overall, I'm very happy with, uh, obviously, minus Fizz, in terms of the new archetypes and the flexibility with them. But, you know, if we think about the other regions, all of them have at least one bad champion or, or very narrow in terms of the application of it and how good it is in the meta. So not surprising here that one of them is going to fall off. And, hey, this does mean, and, and kind of knock on wood, I kind of don't want to see it, Fizz could get buffed later, right? If, if Fizz continues to un underperform and, and have a, a very weak matchup table during the big balance patch two months from now, or I guess seven weeks from now from the time of recording this, uh, Riot could buff it. Uh, it's kind of scary to think that they might buff this and then it becomes too strong because it is a very strong effect, but uh, that is a possibility because this is the new region. They want people to be playing it and they want um, you know people to explore the other options that they have. So beyond that, I kind of want to talk about different archetypes. And here... Commons and rares are really, really cheap to make, right? If you're a new player coming in, uh, the best advice that I can give is to level all of your regions one through eight. So I should say level the first uh, six regions, so everything but Bilgewater one through eight because you get rested bonus experience and that's going to give you the most um, bang for your buck in terms of time invested and wild cards back to you and just other unlocks that you get along the way. So level, let's say, Demacia one to four, then level PNZ one to four, uh, Ionia 1 to 4, then go back and do all 5 through 8 for the rest of them. And that's how you're going to really help to increase your collection and give you a bunch of wild cards or the best collection boosting uh, method so far, right? Obviously, expeditions if you want to talk about XP per hour, but that's another video another time. So let's talk more about the actual archetypes that were founded now in Bilgewater that we're going to be seeing a lot of. If you've seen the other videos or if you've been watching literally anybody's stream room, Terra, you're already familiar with Powder Kegs, right? It's a very strong control archetype. Getting to boost the power of all your damaging spells is really, really important. And both Deckhand and Petty Officer are just staples. So, again, being commons here is very, very nice. And then Petty Officer being a rare, that's that's not hard to get. So, if you like the more mid-range and control strategies, these are definitely some of the cards you should be crafting right away. And again, Powder Keg I have here just for example. It's not something that you put in the deck. It's always formed off these cards and, you know gangplank also has that effect but that's a champion that's a, a different discussion i really just want to focus on the cheap what should i be looking forward to cards because you can probably build these um after your first weekly vault in all honesty and it shouldn't be too too hard from there we have this uh steal your stuff archetype um i know there's a couple different names floating around there i'm sure the community is going to settle on something uh i haven't seen one name so Sorry, at the time of recording this, I don't have a better one to to, uh, to give out what this archetype is going to be called. But I think Steal Your Stuff is good enough. And quite honestly, this is a lot of fun to play. I really do love playing this archetype. And, you know, as soon as I get back to Masters, I definitely want to brew more with this. I think there's actually a uh, a more aggressive Frail Yord Splash list that can still get the value of all these cards. Um, but then you run the Spoils card, which then buffs all your units and lets you draw a unit. So you get to both... Uh, increase the speed at which you're drawing from your own deck and then stealing some of your opponent's cards as well. So uh, the one that kind of stands out from the others, but it fits in the archetype, so I thought it was worth mentioning, is Sleight of Hand. This card right now has uh, seen some play in, in a very Karma decks, uh, because obviously when you get Karma to 10, you get to double the spell effect. And that can be really strong, but it's a slow spell. It costs three. 
um, and you still have to trigger plunder on top of that. So if, as a reminder, that means you have to hit the enemy nexus. So in terms of how much these are seeing play, right, in terms of should you craft them or not, sleight of hand is definitely on the lower side of this. It's just not being played as much, but um, merchant, pilfer goods, and grifter all seeing a ton of play, all very, very safe crafts. If you want to play, again, this more steal your opponent stuff type of archetype. Again, keeping in mind, this is more a guide of what key cards are the archetypes built upon. And then from this, you would say, okay, do I want to do a more control package? Do I want to do a more aggressive package? And, you know, at some point, I'm going to go back and do the other regions. But again, today's video is just going to be focused on Bilgewater. So again, those three cards, pretty safe to build right now. I think that this archetype is only going to get... Um, stronger in the sense that more people are going to be playing it, not that the cards are going to get buffed or anything, but I'm expecting this to see more play in the following weeks. And then Sleight of Hand, some Karma deck can probably use this card, and it, maybe it's a meme, maybe it's actually just really, really strong, who knows, but uh, not something I would put in every deck, but if I'm trying to make a trolley Karma steal your stuff and mill you out deck, absolutely just run it. It's probably going to be a really fun time. Um, and then the last thing I think what a lot of people are probably hoping to get out of this video is the epics, right? So obviously champions are the most expensive purely based on uh, shard count, but the game is a bit more forgiving in terms of the champions that it gives you or gives you access to. Because again, keeping in mind, if you level the weekly vault, you at least get one champion wild card. And then as you're leveling up the different region tracks, right, they give you more champion cards. Riot Games understands that that is a barrier for a lot of people. And there is a budget friendly burn deck going around that's actually championless. Um, and maybe we'll do a video on that in the future. But epics are really a lot of times, if, you, if it's a strong part of the archetype and if it's a core identity, this is actually the roadblock for a lot of new players, and it's very, very frustrating, right? If we think about just this new region, they added nine epics, and that is a ton of cards with a very high cost that can be overwhelming. That's not even taking into consideration the other regions that had epics added. So let's break this down. Let's kind of talk about this, what's you know playable today, maybe what should see play, uh, and then lastly, what what is just meme tier and don't worry about it, right? And, and hopefully somebody will make it uh, a thing later. So playable today, Zap, the Sea Monsters package, and Riptide Rex. Zap is actually uh, the most playable in terms of the variety of decks that it's in right now. So that's a very safe craft. Uh, in, in terms of the value that you're getting out of it, right? You're just getting a, a free spell out of your deck and having an elusive blocker. The Attune mechanic, which is that little circle starburst, if you're not familiar with it, returns one spell mana to your pool. Which is nice, but sometimes, or at least in a lot of the times that the decks that I've played this card, I've already had three spell mana bank because I've been trying to save it over the course of the game. So that's usually not too relevant, but it's nice to get in chip damage in Bilgewater, or in some cases, you just need to block a Shadow Assassin. So again, from a more generic deck building perspective, I think both Zap and Riptide Rex are fair uh, crafts day one, or day one or day whatever it is that you're starting on, right? Um, and then Sea Monsters, Devour the Depths and Shipwreck Hoarder. So Devour the Depths, it's a three of in every Sea Monsters list that I've been able to find. It's a very, very strong card. Sea Monsters is expensive, honestly, from a shard cost standpoint, but it's very, very good. And then Shipwreck Quarter, it's generally a one of, so this one's not necessarily as important, but it's still good uh, in some of the matches where you get the treasure cards can actually help you bring back a losing position, as well as give you two extra toss, which is kind of nice in some situations, right? Um, the Plateworm Egg, which gives you three eight eights on the board, is very, very strong, as you might imagine. So a lot of lists are playing this as a one of, And then Riptide Rex, uh, you've probably seen this card. It's just really great if your opponent has a few weaker units on board. It's just play cleanup, get some uh, face burn damage in. Because, right, once it kills the unit, the rest of the damage is then going to go to the Nexus in instances of one per kill. So um, it's very nice, right, if you just have one unit on their side of the board. If you just know that you need face burn, you just play Riptide Rex, burn them out for six damage. And then generally, if you're on attack, you can you have a 7-4, which is very threatening by itself. And you probably have built up some other units at that time where you're then sw suddenly swinging for lethal. So I would almost go as far to say as I think Riptide Rex is underplayed right now, if only because we see it in like one list uh, and like the, the Shadow Isles, right, Bilgewater control list. It's very prominent there. We've seen some plunder decks kind of float around the meta lately, but it, they've fallen off as well. But it's a very strong effect, and I wouldn't be surprised if this actually increases in playability in the weeks to come in terms of how many decks are playing it and seeing it. I really like the card. It's on my to-do list as soon as I get back into Masters so I can brew some more stuff. And again, I think it's just a very, very solid card. The next tier I would say is 
cards that should see play and ones that I'm honestly kind of surprised that aren't. So Rose is, we know how strong Vulnerable has been, right? In a very board heavy type of deck, this can be a way where you get all value trades across the board and leave you with a board full of units and your opponent none. Now, yes, this does require you to play out a very uh, specific type of board and maybe you have to be in Demacia then because you have such uh, better board positioning with either like Bannerman or just tough units in general, Radiant Guardian, you know, stuff like that where it might be a little bit difficult to get the value out of this, but just stat-wise, a 6-drop, six 6-5, six it's going to kill a lot of stuff. Maybe they have a key threat on their side of the board they need to take care of, um, and it's all enemies gain vulnerable. And keeping in mind, uh, this isn't until end of turn or anything, so even if you don't have the full board clear uh, on the turn that you play this, you can generally later pick up those last couple pieces. So I think this is a very solid card. It's not like a 3 of or anything. I think it's a very solid 1-2 to two of that should see more play, and I think will once the meta has a bit more uh, time to resolve. And then the last two, both Siren and Dreadway, right? Misfortune and Gangplague's Boats. Honestly, just tutoring or getting the champion you need right out of your deck is a very strong effect. And it's kind of shocking that these haven't seen a lot of play right now. Um, but again, I could see this seeing a bit more play down the road just because getting that champion card to your hand is such a strong effect. And then again, with both of their effects, right? So with Siren being able to deal extra damage and then Dreadway being able to double all damage, these are very strong effects. And... I think once people have more time to explore different combinations, these will definitely both see more play because they, they just become combo enablers at some point or the value that you're getting off them is going to be so strong that it helps you come back. So again, very expensive. I wouldn't necessarily craft any of these three cards right now, but you know if you want to brew and if you want to try it out, uh, go ahead. I think that these should have some place in the meta as if you're willing to put in the effort. But again, if you're fully free to play and you really need to min-max your resources, then I would say wait a little bit and see how the meta develops to make these cards playable or not. And then the last uh, tier, we'll say just good old meme tier, right? So not seeing any play. And um, I really think that, you know, between these two cards, if I had to bet on one, I would say mind meld because if you put this in like an Ionia deck, there's got to be something here. Like, it's just too strong of an effect to, to not see any play right now. But in terms of, you know, is it going to be a Tier 1 deck or a Tier 2 deck? Who knows? Then that's why it's going to be in this last tier. And then Jagged Taskmaster, right? We've seen Von Yip and that, that type of deck where, you know, granting one-cost alleys in effect or a permanent buff. And it just hasn't been good, period. Uh, so maybe at some point we're going to hit a critical mass where all these one drops will be relevant and really, really strong. I know some people try to pair this with a Poro deck and it was, this was actually the weakest card in the Poro deck, uh, Taskmaster that is. So probably not anytime soon. We're going to see either of these cards. If we see one of them, it's absolutely going to be mind meld. And if somebody can make this work in an Ionia list, I think you could probably go the distance. I don't know if it's a Lee Sin variant because you have all the double spells, um, maybe it's a PNZ variant because you have all the removal tools, plus you have a uh, flash of brilliance, right? Which helps you increase that, uh, that spell counter. And then, right, gives you the elusive turret. So in theory, you could have like Heimerdinger generating all these turrets for you. And then on, suddenly on one turn with mind meld, you just have a, an OTK board where they have to block everything, or they just have a ruin, ruination on hand, um, and you should win the game. So right now, again, putting in the memes category, cause I just don't think it's going to, um, be a tier one deck anytime soon, but I definitely could see this being a key combo piece later on down the line where somebody has a, a deck that gets to utilize this. So with that, that's a quick look at Bilgewater and some of the new cards and the new archetypes that are popping up and what cards you should craft today or should feel safe crafting today and maybe some of the other ones that you should hold off on. So I do plan to get around to the other regions eventually. These videos do take a little bit longer to to put together and kind of sculpt out in the sense that I it's very early on in the meta, right? So I don't want to make any too early of calls, but I think some of these are very fair right now in terms of what we're seeing. And that's why, at least with Bilgewater, I feel very confident in the list that I put together in terms of the different tiers that they fall into and what you can craft versus what you shouldn't craft, uh, where PNZ might need a little bit more time, right? So for example, Vi was very underplayed, and now all of a sudden it's a staple in the Karina decks that now everybody is playing. So a lot has changed in this first, uh, I guess, technically week and a half of the time of recording this, and who knows where the next few steps will go. So, of course, as always, I appreciate you guys taking the time to check out the video. If you want to see more Legends of Runeterra content, don't forget to subscribe. And as always, you can catch me on Twitch Monday through Friday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Climbing through ranked, and I do try to dedicate a couple days to memes every now and again just to have fun and shake up the ladder grind. So, with that... That's a recap on Bilgewater, what you should craft, and I'll see you guys next time. Cheers.